Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. There's nothing more exciting than being in the house of God on a Sunday morning. As I begin to just walk and pray, I begin to look through the aisles, and I notice that um, every time you come to church, the Word of God becomes more intense, becomes the understanding and the living Word of God becomes even more so because when you begin to look through each aisle and each row, you begin to see walking miracles, walking healings, and then I begin to see a lot of walking answered prayers that men and women have prayed for their sons, for their daughters, for loved ones, and I'm seeing them here today in the house of God. And it just brought to my attention and God began to speak. He said, my word never dies. But what I say I'm going to do, I always follow through and fulfill it. And today we're in the house of God where the word of God is continual and it can never die. But the greatest thing that God has ever given any of his people, we talked about the miracles, we talked about the healings and all these answer prayers, but God filled each and every one of us with the Holy Ghost. How many of you are happy and excited that God has filled you with his spirit? Oh, hallelujah. I think it's acceptable and appropriate today if we would just lift our hands right now. And if God has filled you with the spirit, why don't you begin to speak in the Holy Ghost right now and begin to call on the name of Jesus. Come on, there's a witness in the house this morning. The word of God is living through his people. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We worship you. We worship you. There is nobody like you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, why don't we begin to lift them up right now for a few more moments. Come on. The Holy Ghost is doing something in the house today. Oh, why don't we go ahead and worship with the praise team? Oh, hallelujah.
us this morning as we sing this song. Hallelujah. We love you today, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Why don't you put your hands together? I love Jesus. He's my Savior. When storms are raging, He's my shelter. Where He leads me, I will follow. I love Jesus. He loves me. Let's sing that today. Let's sing that to Jesus. Storms are raging. Yes, you see, He's my shelter. Where He leads me, I will follow. I love Jesus. He loves me. Let's sing that one more time. 
Why don't we lift our hands right now and just call on that name, that mighty, powerful name. the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Dark addiction starts to break. Hello. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name.
the name, the name above all other names. Speak the name, the name the wind and waves of pain. All of Nothing stays the same. Heaven is great. At the mention of the name, our spirits moving, burning like a flame, healing the broken. Are the one we proclaim. Raise it up, fill the sky. And mountains move, we lift him high, speak the name, the name above all other names, speak the name, the name the wind and waves away, all of heaven's coming down, feel the earth.
you, Jesus. Hallelujah. One more time, would you just release that name into the atmosphere? You can feel that there's a shift when you begin to speak that name. Hallelujah. It's more than just the sound of the words, but it's what the name represents. All of the identity is wrapped up in the name of God. That's why it says in the song that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run there into and are safe. I don't know what you're struggling with today, but there's just something about speaking that name in the atmosphere. It's like worry starts to lift off of your shoulders. Anxiety starts to tremble and dissipate. You can feel it. There's a scenario when Jesus said that Abraham longed to see my day. And the the doubters looked at him and said, you're not even 40 years old yet. How could you say Abraham wanted to see your day? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And when he said that, the Bible says that they physically fell down on their backs because there's something about the revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ. There's something special when oneness people, rather than a Trinitarian, rather than a Mormon, rather than just somebody who can say it, but someone who's got the revelation. Woo! You can feel it. It pushes on you. Woo! Shut up. Would you just lift your hands one more time? Just speak the name of Jesus. hallelujah it's like a wave in this building right now you can feel it sweeping from the left uh, to the right from the front to the back Uh, Jesus we speak your name Jesus we speak healing Jesus we speak deliverance Uh, Jesus we speak peace with that same spirit and revelation we're going to speak the name of Jesus over our city amen there's a hunger for the things of God that's reviving and sweeping over our nation you can see it even on social media people are more hungry for the things of God and I believe that uh, there have been breakouts of hunger but I believe that what God is going to do in Stockton is going to be more than an expression of hunger but it's going to be a pouring out of his spirit uh, like we've never seen before. Amen. Woo, I feel faith in the house. Would you lift your hands? Uh, would you pray in faith one more time in the name of the Lord Jesus? Uh, God, I pray that the hunger that's felt around this nation would be directed towards truth. It would be directed toward the seed of the word of God. Uh, Lord, I pray that your people at Christian Life Center, Lord, we'd lay hold of the promises. Uh, we'd lay hold of faith. Uh, God, let there be unity in the house. Uh, God, let there be spontaneous prayer uh, that breaks out on the campus. Uh, let it be more than organized, but let it be sovereign. God, I pray that you would go down the streets of Stockton. Prepare the way for the harvesters, uh, places of business, schools. uh, We pray for the college campuses. uh, Let revival break out at UOP. Let revival break out at Delta College. uh, Let revival break out in the high schools, uh, every place of business. uh, God, that we'd be going to the hospitals, uh, see people healed and saved uh, and delivered, getting out of stretchers. God, I believe it can happen. uh, I believe it's going to happen. Touch your people. Touch our backsliders. Touch our prodigals. Touch our lost loved ones. God, we intercede. We knock on heaven's door right now. We come boldly before the throne of grace. We lay hold to every word that it will not fall to the ground. If you believe in the work God is doing, would you clap your hands to the Lord?
Come on, I think we can do better than that. I believe it's going to happen. I believe it's happening. I believe God is doing it. And He's not going to do it next year. He's going to do it right now. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We prayed for the Lord's needs. We prayed for laborers. Now we're going to pray for our needs this morning. We're going to pray that God would do a miracle. I know people have come into the building. You've got an impossible situation, whether it's a diagnosis. One of our dear beloved members, Brother Jose Cisneros, is requesting prayer this morning. He's in the hospital. He's not able to walk. It's just not a good diagnosis. But I know a God that's able to take impossible situations. And work a miracle for his glory. That every person in that hospital, every nurse, every doctor, every attendant will be able to see that God is doing a work. Amen. So if you've got a need, would you slip your hand high? We're going to pray for you. Amen. Christian Life Center all across the building. There's people with their hands lifted. We're going to pray for Brother Gregory Cisneros as well. Lost his daughter last week. We're going to pray for comfort over him. It's Christian Life Center. Turn around. Find somebody with their hand raised. Share your faith with them. Believe God's going to do a miracle right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray for every impossible situation. We stand here as ambassadors for the name of Jesus Christ. And we speak against cancer right now. We command you to be gone. Cancer, you're not going to take one more member of this church. We speak against diabetes. We speak against heart disease. In the name of Jesus, we speak against fear. God, I pray that you would put broken marriages back together. People who've got the divorce papers, put them back together in Jesus' name. God, I pray for a financial miracle on those who have been faithful, on those that have been faithful to your word, have been faithful to give their tithe and their offering. I pray you do a miracle in their life right now. Jesus, we believe in the impossible. We believe you're going to do it. Thank you for doing it. Thank you that we could believe in you. One more time, if you believe God did a miracle, would you begin to praise Him in advance for it right now? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can make your way back to your places. I have just a couple quick announcements. Praise God. Such a wonderful spirit of God here this morning. Amen. I, I felt like 2023, every service has been a sovereign move of the spirit. God is preparing his people. God is working among his people. And we're going to be ready for everything that God does. Amen. Amen. First announcement, all the ladies, give God eight tonight. Amen. I, I have been hearing overwhelming positive feedback from the ladies. It's been going well. The attendance has been very, very uh, exciting. And so we're going to begin the second week of Give God A here, 5 p.m. in this facility. If you were not able to make it last week, you want to make it this week. Amen? Amen. Uh, something very exciting uh, that Pastor Haney, it was his vision the ladies have been doing their Give God Aid in small groups. He pulled Pastor Villanueva and myself in a little while ago, and God gave him a particular burden that the young men would not be left behind in this endeavor. Amen. And so the ladies are doing their second week. Tonight, the young men, youth and young adults, we're going to be giving our, beginning our own version of Give God Aid, but we're going, to be, we're going to be calling it Vessels of Honor. The reason we're doing that is because there is such an attack on the masculinity of young men and the purity of young men. And scripture teaches that there's two types of vessels that can be used, a vessel for honor, but a vessel for dishonor. God will use a vessel. God will use politicians. God will use ungodly and unrighteous men. But at the end of the day, we don't just want to be used, but we want to be a vessel that's honorable before the eyes of the Lord. Amen. 
And so we're going to be beginning that tonight, all the young men. It's going to be at 5 p.m. The, the general session will be on our West Lane campus in the Student Center. You want to be there. Afterwards, we're gonna have a basketball fellowship for all those that attended the Bible study. It's gonna be a wonderful time. So find a young man, uh, invite them. It's gonna be a great time, amen. And for the rest of the men, Brother Kenny, we have fire on the mountain, amen. That's gonna be wonderful. It's gonna be April 28th through the 30th. It's gonna be $170. We're going back old school at Old Oak Ranch, amen. Gonna be a wonderful time. If you're a man, you have not registered, please do so in the lobby. You will not regret it. It'll be a great blessing for your life. Everyone said, praise the Lord. Amen, if you would all stand with me, we're gonna take our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Let me try that one more time. I might have caught you off guard. The Bible said, God loveth a cheerful giver, amen. We're gonna take our Sunday morning tithe and offering, amen. <laughs> Praise God. As they put the declaration on the screen, we're gonna read it together. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> Upon the authority of the word of God, we declare that the Lord is our provider. As one who ties and give offerings, I am entitled to his blessings and protection from the attacks of the enemy. Therefore, I bring my tithe and offering into your storehouse today, knowing that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. For employees, we claim good jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, promotions and benefits, and favor with our employers and customers in the workplace. For business owners, we claim favorable contracts and growth that these businesses will be profitable and a blessing to the kingdom. For his people, the Lord shall supply income, inheritances, estates, interests, rebates, unexpected gifts and blessings. Bills and debts will be paid off, allowing me to live debt free. Woo. Since spiritual blessings follow the giver, I declare that my whole family is saved and in relationship with God. We receive perfect health, healing, deliverance, and walking in the divine favor and blessing of the Almighty. I am blessed coming in and going out, and all that I put my hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands to the Lord this morning? Thank you, Jesus. On the lower floors, you can march. On the balcony, they will wait on you. God bless you as you give.
Amen, amen, amen. Christian Life Center, I'm going to invite you to stand with me just one last time. We want to welcome all of our guests and our visitors. Can we give it up for our guests and our visitors? Thank you so much for coming to fellowship with us this morning. We hope that you would make Christian Life Center your church family. Amen. We have a room to my right called the Genesis Room. We want to invite you. Come have a cup of coffee. Meet. We have pastors that will be there to answer any questions. But most importantly, we just want to get to know your name know a little bit about you. Christian Life Center, would you turn around, find someone you don't know, and welcome into the house of God. in this place, sitting in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If we can stand to our feet, we're going to read the Word of God briefly, and then we're going to pray that God would have His way over the Word today. Uh, in many ways, this sermon, this message, it, it, it has been in my heart for weeks now. And in many ways, uh, the young adult ministry here called Lifeline uh, has received the first fruits of what God has been dealing with me. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, chapter 12, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12. We're going to start there and go through a journey in Scripture. A lot to say. No, I'm not, I don't have the wisdom to say it all in its appropriate time. I need the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
But uh, this is a part of a subject that God has really been dealing with me. And in many ways, this feels like part one of two things, two parts that God has given me. And uh, today I want to talk about joy. I want to talk about joy. A very powerful, powerful, I feel the Holy Ghost just saying it. I want to talk about joy today. And I don't know what's going to happen this morning, but I've touched the glory of God. I've touched glory, and I feel what God is trying to do in His people. And I just pray that God is able to use me to unravel it, that the Lord God would be revealed to your hearts and your minds, and you would be acquainted with the joy of the Lord in your lives. Hebrews 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Help us, Jesus. And the sin which so easily ensnares us. Ensnares us. Help us, God. And let us run with endurance. Somebody say endurance. The race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured, someone say endured, the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, today in the name of Jesus, we come before you, Lord. God, open our hearts and our minds, God, today to receive your word. Let us be transformed by it, God, this day. Let us touch the glory, God, that would transform us from glory to glory into the same image, the image of Christ, Lord. We'd become more like you, Father, that we would gain, Father, the strength to endure According to the glory that you have revealed to us, your church, we love you and we thank you for the Holy Ghost today. We thank you for your spirit, for your presence. We thank you for your power. By your grace, we are here. We don't deserve it, God. And we give you all the glory today. Can we just raise our hands, church, and worship God and be thankful for his spirit? We love you. 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 Anybody love the Lord today? Anybody love Him? Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for glory. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your presence here this morning. Oh, we love you, Lord. We love you, we love you, we love you. And we give you the glory. We magnify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may take your seats. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Let me, uh, I'm going to do my best to explain this here this morning before we move on. We have a lot of scripture to go over. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, by cloud of witnesses in the word of God, this is very important that you understand the context of a particular passage of scripture. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that the cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrews is speaking about are the individuals of faith, the men of faith of old, uh, patriarchs and prophets and individuals who God poured out his spirit upon to prophesy and to live their lives according to a particular promise that God had given them. 
And he says that we, as the church, as the people of God, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses as if they're observing what the church is doing today, as if they're witnesses of what is occurring in the life of the people of God. There is a perception in heaven, it seems, that what the scripture is saying is that there's perception in the heavenlies with the saints of God that are aware of what is happening in the church today. Even in these last days, there's such a great cloud of witnesses who are observing how the church today is running their race. Amen. And so the word of God says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. All the weights of this life, all of the influences of this life, the concerns of this world that are constantly trying to pull at our minds, the concerns of this world that is constantly trying to pull at our hearts to keep us attached to fickle things that will pass away, keep us attached to careers and keep us attached to sickness and problems in this world that get our minds on the earthly things such that we begin to forget the heavenly things and even the promises of God, even our own salvation. Therefore, we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because this world is constantly trying to get us to think in terms of this world, of the here and now. What am I going to enjoy now? What am I going to experience now that can give me pleasure where am I going to eat now what job do I want to get now what home do I want to buy now what car do I want to buy now what clothing do I want to buy next and we're so attached to the things of this world the weight that so easily ensnares us the word of God implies here then that those kinds of weights they slow us down in the kingdom of God they slow us down in the ways of God because we're running a race. We're running a race. See, and the word of God says that the sin that so easily ensnares us as well. Now, this is talking about the ensnarement uh, that is similar to when a hunter goes out and attempts to ensnare a prey. The word of God says that Satan is like a roaring lion. He's seeking who he, could, who he can devour. This is the kind of ensnarement that it, we're talking about, Scripture is talking about, that as you run your race, there is sin that is attempting to ensnare your foot, a bear trap that's trying to snap onto your foot and keep you from running the race. And it so easily ensnares us, meaning that sin is so ready to hand. It's right in front of you, and it's available for you to get caught up in and to get, for you to get involved in. It's, it's giving us a warning that sometimes life is not going to be easy. Sometimes life is going to be difficult. Sometimes we're going to encounter some problems in life that tempt us in ways that we never imagined we could be tempted. The, the enemy is going to attempt us to say things and do things and participate in plans of this world that are so enlaced with sin and corruption. The Word of God says, be careful when you're running your race because there is sin that's so easily ensnares us and catches us it says let us run with endurance the race that is set before us with endurance the race that is set before us and then the word of God says let me give you an example in other words looking unto Jesus look at Jesus who ran his race Look at Jesus who was born and died and, and observed the way that he lived his life, running a race. And we see evidences of this throughout the life of Jesus. At one point, the Lord Jesus says th things like, I must needs go through Samaria. He felt a call. He, he felt uh, the need to go through Samaria. He was running his race. I have to go there. I have to go here. I can't go over there. I can't preach here, but I have to preach there. I can't preach to these people, but I've got to preach over here. And he was making decisions and judgments, running his race, uh, being sure to avoid the weights that so easily ensnare 
there. The word of God says that he was tempted. He was tempted in all things like you and I. However, he was never ensnared by sin. He was the perfect man, not being caught up by the things of this world. However, because he had a body like you and I, because he had a flesh that hungered like you and I and thirsted like you and I and craved things like you and I, he was tempted like you and I. But when it came to the power that was working within him, he was able to say, my meat and my food, it's not of this, this world, but I have food that you know not of, and I can only do what the Father tells me to do. There was something driving him on the inside to run the race, to go to the next place, to preach on the next mountainside, to go to Jerusalem and flip over the chair. The, the tables of the money changers uh, and then to go out to Galilee and heal the sick. Hallelujah. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This is talking about how God is the one who authors our faith in him. In other words, he's the one who begins the story. In the beginning was your name. And he sees your life. And at a certain point in time, he writes into the story of your life. And then my child heard the gospel on a street corner one day. And then my child heard the gospel through a saint in their work one day. And they came to church. And they felt the presence of God. They felt my presence and I washed them in my blood, and I filled them with my spirit. He's the author of your faith. He began your faith. If you have any spark within you whatsoever, if you have any hunger to know God, you are not the originator of that story. You are not the author. God is the author. And the reason why you are here is not because you called yourself that you convinced yourself, but it's because God had a plan for your life. God had a plan and a destiny for you. And you were in the mind of God. And God said, I'm going to reveal myself to my daughter. I'm going to reveal myself to my son. And I'm going to show them who I am. He is the author. But you know what's so powerful here is that it says he's also the finisher of your faith. That doesn't mean that your faith is going to finish. That means that your faith is going to carry you to the end. Come on. Your faith is going to carry you to the other side. What am I talking about? Your faith is going to carry you across the river Jordan. Amen. Your faith, it's going to take you through the ups and the downs of life. Hey, your faith, it's going to take you through the hard times and the good times. Your faith is going to take you through your trials. Your faith is going to take you through your tribulations. Your faith is going to take you through COVID-19. And guess what? You're going to make it through to the other side because you have a God who is the author. And he who started a good work in you is able to finish it. He's able to finish it even unto the end. He is the finisher of your faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I believe we have, we unfortunately, because it's been watered down in many ways and we use it so often, the role of joy has been severely underestimated in the world today. When we think of Jesus and we think of what he had to endure, and you know what's so unique about Jesus is not just that he was whipped and that he had a crown of thorns. And that he was stabbed in his side. That he suffered. And he was whipped with the cat of nine tails. There were others who had been whipped with the cat of nine tails. That's why it existed. It was a common form of torture. Jesus was not the only one that had endured that kind of pain. However, 
What makes his sacrifice unique is that no one has ever endured that kind of pain and been a holy God at the same time. No one has ever endured that kind of shame and been God in the flesh at the same time. No one has ever been so unworthy of that thing. And yet, he endured it for us. And when we think of that enduring, when we think of the pain that Jesus experienced, we have to realize what, when we first think of the kind of endurance that's required to go through pain, we think of grit, right? We think of courage. We think of pain tolerance. But can I tell you, it was not Jesus' ability to endure pain that took him to the cross. It was not Jesus' ability to have grit that took him to the cross and endured suffering. The word of God says it was the joy that was set before him. It was joy that took him through pain. It was joy that took him through suffering. It was joy that led him to take the sin that belonged to you and take the condemnation that belonged to you and say, I'm going to put it on my own back and I'm going to carry your sin, your transgression, your darkness, your depression, your anxiety. I'm going to take your pain and I'm going to be bruised for your transgressions. I'm going to be wounded for your iniquities. Why? Not because I have grit. Not because Jesus has courage, but because Jesus has joy. Hey, I believe that this is why the Word of God describes joy as being unspeakable and full of glory. It's joy unspeakable. That means that there is a level of joy that cannot be explained by human reason. There is a level of joy that cannot be understood with the rational mind. It's a joy that drives you to do things that other people would not do. It drives you to participate in things that other people would not participate in because it is a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Whew, I feel the Holy Ghost today. For the joy that was set before him. Then he endured the cross. That word endured is very important because now the life of Jesus is linked to the life of the church. In the verse prior it says run with endurance. The race that is what set before you. And Jesus for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. Wow. He's making connections. The Word of God is making connections here. Now, what was the joy that was set before him? That's what we have to answer now. That's what we have to understand. I want to take you to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 9. This is a prophecy about the life of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The Word of God says, 53, 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, the Word of God says, then he shall see his seed. <laughs> he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Praise God. When the Lord is to be crucified, when the Lord is to be bruised for our transgressions and our iniquities, 
the word of God says that in the midst of that pain, in the midst of that suffering, he is going to see something. And what is he going to see? The word of God says he's going to see his seed. He's going to see his seed. And he is going to rejoice. Why? Because he knows that the price that he is paying is for the sin of many. And he's taking the sin of sinners upon himself. And because he can see the seed. And he can see that one day that seed, it's going to give birth and it's going to give life. Joy came inside of his soul and joy came inside of his mind. Not because he was able to endure pain, but because he had a revelation and an understanding of his seed that would be washed in his blood. His seed that would be full of the Holy Ghost. Who did Jesus see and what brought Jesus joy? It is none other than you. And it's none other than me. It's none other than this church that has been purchased by the blood. How humbling, right? Because that somebody would feel as much joy, joy enough to do something for me. You see, this is a natural part of human behavior, right? We are grateful when people find joy in us. This is why birthday parties are oftentimes so important. And I do believe birthday parties are important. I think we have lost in many ways the art of celebration in the world today. Why are birthday parties important? It's because people around us, friends around us, recognize we are happy that you were born. Does anybody ever feel grateful that somebody was happy that they were born? You see, a lot of people, they've, they've never experienced the joy of somebody else being happy that they were born. And it's a very important emotion that your existence is recognized and that your name is recognized and says, you right there, you, we're happy that you're here. Did you, do you realize that Jesus, he saw your life, even the mess that you would make of it, even the darkness that you would give your heart to, even the failure that you would give your mind to, and he looked beyond your sin and transgression. He looked beyond your failures. He looked beyond your shortcomings, and he looked beyond all of that darkness. And he saw that someday, somehow, you're going to come and you're going to hear the gospel. And he was able to see the seed, the seed of your life, such that he was able to say, I don't care what they have done. I've paid the price for their sin, but I see an individual full of my spirit. I see an individual washed by the blood. I don't see the sin. I see the woman of faith. I see the man of faith that will come out of this situation. And you know what he did? He threw a birthday party for you. But that birthday party is not what you think. He was whipped with the cat and nine tails and he put a crown on his head. Why? Because he felt joy. He felt joy for your life. He was glad that you're here. He's glad that you're here in this place. Your God has joy for you. He has joy for your life. He recognizes who you are. He says, I know you, and I know you by name. I know your name, and I celebrate the fact that sin couldn't keep you down because my blood was more powerful than your sin. Oh, I think we in turn need to celebrate the grace of God for a few moments. Can we just clap our hands to the Lord and release a joyful noise to God? Come on. Hey, Oh, we celebrate you, God. We celebrate you, God, because you first celebrated us. You felt joy for the joy that was set before you. See, this is connected to Hebrews 11 in such a powerful way. In Hebrews 11, 1, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. 
Hallelujah. It says that for it by for it the elders, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. And, and this this uh, here is sometimes understood be, misunderstood because it's not that they received a good testimony, but it's that they became witnesses of what God was going to do. It, God revealed something to a, to them a substance that could not be seen by eyes, but they saw it in the spirit substance that they could hear with their ears but not physically but they could see and they could hear the promises of God that were given unto them and something was revealed to them I'm speaking in the spirit now okay there's something was given to them and they could witness it with their own eyes and they became witnesses and they said God has given me a promise and what is this promise this promise it, it manifested in a few ways and we'll go over a few of them it says by faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible which means uh, that there is a level there is a dimension of seeing things in the kingdom of God uh, that goes beyond what can be observed with the physical eye and what can be rationalized with the ear it goes beyond what can be done two plus two equals four and it sees beyond that and says but sometimes two plus two equals five why because I serve a God that transgresses the laws of this world and so your tragedy with your emotional instability should have equaled that you lost your mind. But one day you came to an altar and God filled you with his spirit. And two plus two did not equal four. In that day something happened. It equaled five. And God did something impossible. Oh, kadaba satanama. You should not be here right now. You should not be praising God, but you are. You are here. All the glory to God. Hey, because faith, faith can see what the eyes can see. Faith can see and hear what the ears do not perceive. Therefore, I had not seen nor ear hath heard all the things that God hath prepared for those who love him, but they are revealed by the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The day you were saved, you got the deep things of God that this world doesn't understand. You got the deep things of God that psychology cannot explain. You got the hey, deep things of God that the culture of this world cannot explain. According to the laws of this world, you should be dead and gone. According to the laws of this world, you should be downpressed so hard that you have no way of rising. But when God called you, he took you from being a victim to being victorious. That's the joy that God could see. That's the joy that took him to the cross. He saw a people that were redeemed. They're redeemed by his blood. They're saved. He saw you praising him on a Sunday morning. He saw you shouting. He saw you giving him glory. He saw you right now. He saw you today. He saw your hands lifted high. He saw your voice shouting glory. He saw you worshiping his holy name for the joy. For Endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Hey. For a few more moments, can we just raise our hands one more time? We love you. Glory, 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 glory. I'm going to continue on Hebrews 11, verse 8. For by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. Whew, God gave him a promise. 
And he went out not knowing where he was going. His eyes couldn't see it. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You see, Abraham, he, he had a promise from God, but he already had a revelation in the spirit. Because he saw the promised land. He saw the ground that God was going to give him as an inheritance. But as he was walking and he was looking, he knew that the earthly realm, the earthly land, there's something else that God was trying to do. He said, there's another city. There's another city that I've seen in the spirit. Ah, There's another city that I've seen in the Holy Ghost whose maker, whose architect is not man. But it's God himself whose builder and maker is God. You see, we are witnesses of that city as well. When we know that this world is not our home. And we travel through this world as in a foreign land. We travel this world as a land as strangers. It repeats itself. And I'm just going to say this and leave this here. The word of God, the will of God for the future is not to make heaven above the earth where it's disconnected from the earth. This is why the Lord God says, thy kingdom come, thy, heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in the book of Revelation, it says that heaven is going to come to earth. And Jesus is going to reign on here in the earth. And we are going to reign with him as kings and priests. Which means that this earth is going to be our home in Revelation. But right now, like Abraham walked the land of promise as a foreigner, we walk this land as strangers. See, in Spanish, it's really powerful. It says, peregrinos. We're pilgrims. We're just traveling. And you know what? We're going to reign on this earth. But we look beyond the laws and the rules of this age. Because our power comes from an age that's not of this one. Our power, ecotobos, it comes from an age that is to come. And so we walk in this earth that one day will become heaven. But right now, we're foreigners as a Abraham walked in the land of promise. Oh, I got to move on. I can't stay there too long. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Hey, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense, meaning that Isaac himself was a type of Jesus Christ. Right? And Abraham himself, when God asked him to give up Isaac, he rejoiced for the seed. Hmm. Even though God asked Abraham to give up his son Isaac, he knew, I have already received a promise, which means... God told me it's going to be through Isaac. So even if Isaac dies, God is going to raise him from the dead because it has to be through him. I rejoice in my seed, my seed that will produce the promise. I feel you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. And Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in the figurative sense. So the word of God continues on. Let me go into Hebrews chapter 12. So now we have a good context for what it actually means that Jesus ran his race according to the joy that was set before him. The word of God also gives us a contrast of individuals who did not run the race. If we go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 says, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Which means be encouraged. Be encouraged. You yourself be encouraged. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You have to understand that the way that these 
writers they wrote, they wrote in, in poetry, parallelism. We're actually going to see one here. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So in the next passage then, he explains what does it look like, what is required to have peace with all people. And what does it look like to have holiness? Pursue peace and holiness. Verse 15, looking carefully lest anyone shall fall, anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Wow. It says, help each other. Help each other. This is pursuing peace with one another. Carefully help each other. Lest anyone fall short. If you see someone falling short, help them. Don't kick them. Don't push them to the ground. Don't say, well, I always knew they were going to backslide. It was obvious. None of that. No. No. Help them. If their heart and their mind is right, their heart and their mind, is, they're just weak and they fell into sin, but they know that they're a sinner and they say, I know where I'm at, but I just need the help of God. Help them. Pray for them. Encourage them. Come on, church. That's how we're going to have revival. By helping one another. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. Here comes holiness. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Profane meaning ungodly. Profane meaning unholy. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. He sold his promise. He sold the promise that was given to him. And what did he sell it for? For a morsel of food, weight that so easily besets us. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. What does this mean? That we can be distracted by a morsel of food. If you know the story of Esau, you know that he went out hunting out into the field. The word of God says that he was hunting so long he came back tired and hungry starving he exaggerated a little bit he said Jacob give me some food lest I die I highly doubt that he would have died All right but that's how our problems feel sometimes come on that's how our discouragement feel that's how our loneliness feels sometimes give me something lest I die Netflix Give me some type of enjoyment lest I die. Sin. Give me something lest I perish because my body is hungry for some type of satisfaction. A higher paying job that keeps you from the house of the Lord. That for one morsel of food that his body was craving, that he was hungry for, he sold something. He sold the promise. He sold his birthright. And he said, and the word of God says, this is profane. This is not holiness. With holiness, you will see the Lord. Which means when you hold on to your promise and you're able to see beyond the rewards of this world. And you're able to look past all the sin and all the things of this world. To see the joy that is set before you. The glory that is to come. If you should persevere, then you're willing to say no to the morsel of food. Why? Why? Because there is a birthright that God has given me as his child. There is a promise that the Lord has given me as his child. There is something that God has given me and selling it for a morsel of food is not worth it. Selling it for a temporary pleasure, it's not worth it. But can I tell you, sometimes it's so easy. 
It's so easy to be tempted to sell it. It's so easy to be tempted to let it go. Why? Because eating a meal is right here, right now. Partaking in sin is so fast. It's so immediate. Your pride, it's right here. And you can take it up to try to defend yourself. But that is sin that so easily ensnares us. That's the morsel of food that's trying to convince you if you don't fight for justice yourself nobody's going to do it for you however vengeance is of the Lord saith God and we're busy fighting for ourselves we're busy putting up walls of pride and bitterness we're busy partaking of the sins of this world why because like Esau we sometimes we have a weak body and it's right in front of us but someone's got to get a revelation of the joy that is set before you today. Come on, somebody's got to get a revelation of what God is taking you to. A revelation so powerful that you're able to ignore the weight, the weight, the weight, the weight that besets you. And the sin that's looking to ensnare. I'm talking about joy still today. I'm talking about the joy of the Lord. Which is the strength of your salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The joy, the joy, the joy. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. This is the day of salvation. And meanwhile, there is life, there is hope. But one day, that day will end. And I think we can safely say we're in the sunset of the God preaching of the gospel. The sun is setting. The day is coming to a close. And Jesus Christ is coming for his church at any moment. Don't sell your promise for a morsel of food. We need a revelation of the joy of God today. We need a revelation of the joy that is set before us. You see, this dynamic of Jesus, how he ran his race, and he was willing to endure the pain of this world because of the joy that was set before him, it repeats itself in our lives. And I want to take you there. I know I've already taken a long time, but there's so much the Lord has placed in my heart. And if you're willing to endure with me to the end, I, I, I think you'll be blessed by it. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Is anyone willing to go on this journey a little farther? Thank you, God. Help me, Jesus. It says here, Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. <laughs> the joy that is set before us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Powerful. Let's skip to verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now not only that but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption the redemption of our body hmm. this is what we're waiting for this is the hope that is set before us the redemption of our bodies but meanwhile we're in this earth we experience the birth pangs the birth pangs of a corrupt world the birth pangs of sickness, the birth pangs of all kinds of imbalances within our bodies. We experience the death of this world, the death that is sowed into our body. You see, our bodies know, even on a subconscious level, that we are going towards death. 
and as we proceed towards death in our life things begin to break down our joints begin to break down our organs they begin to break down our our body begins to break down that's the product of sin within the world that was sown into the very dna the fabric of our body which is why we seek to maximize pleasure even if it's through sin and preserve our life at all costs people sell their own children people sell their own family for the sake of survival for the sake of having pleasure people betray each other and friends betray each other just for a few more hundred dollars just for a little bit more in this world because we know that we're on our way to death and if there's going to be anything I'm going to get mine and I'm going to get my own and I'm going to have my own happiness because life is too short but what they don't realize is that they're so short sighted to not realize that there's a life after this one there's a life that's waiting for us when we die it doesn't all end here and only what we do in Christ will remain but meanwhile, we're in this world, we feel the groanings. We feel the pain that there is something wrong with this world. There's something not quite right. There are earthquakes that make things fall down and people die. There's floods. There's tsunamis. There's pestilence. There's all kinds of viruses. There's all kinds of bacteria that end up destroying the body. And this earth is groaning for the revelation of the sons of God. This earth is groaning in pain. They're called birth pangs. Why? Because the body of the woman is created as a type of the process of the world before the coming of Jesus Christ, which makes all things right. That means that there's a reflection of what I'm talking about even within childbirth. Because, and I, of course, I will never go through this, but I have heard that it's painful to have a child. My respect and my honor to all our mothers who are here in this building. God bless you. Thank you. Do you know why you experience that? It's because your body is a type of prophecy. So God said that the woman is going to have pain through childbirth. But if you know anything about having a child, and you know what? I don't, but I've heard that it's also joyful. I've heard that it's also a happy time. I've heard that after the pain, when your child is in your hands, you realize life has been created even in the midst of pain. I believe that this is actually what that scripture talks about, that a woman shall be saved even as through childbirth. It doesn't mean that childbirth will save a woman, but the joy that comes on the other side of childbirth. You will be able to endure the pain and the suffering of childbirth. And that faith that something is coming on the other side will carry you through that temporary moment of pain. Because on the other side, there is joy. On the other side, there is deliverance. On the other side... There's life, there's life, there's life, there's life. And so in this world today, we're experiencing pains of childbirth. There's drug addicted everywhere. There's sin everywhere. There's darkness everywhere. But if you can endure to the other side, God has life. And he's going to make all things right. So the word of God continues here. This is how it works in our lives. The word of God continues here in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the spirit when we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly. Verse 26. Likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we 
ought but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be echoed now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God and so the Holy Spirit also groans. It groans with this perception that there's something wrong with the world. But you see, the human mind sometimes seeks to satisfy the pain of death in human ways and sinful ways. For we know not how to pray as we ought in our rational mind because we have the weakness of our flesh. But when the Spirit gets a hold of us, we begin to pray beyond the physical limitations of this world we begin to pray beyond the science of the circumstance we begin to pray beyond the facts of our bank accounts we begin to pray beyond the facts of a doctor that says you're going to die we begin to pray beyond the fact that Stockton is a city that's too dark and too good on. We begin to pray beyond the sociologists that say there is no hope for this city because when we pray in the Spirit, when we pray in the Holy Ghost, we don't pray according to the logic of this world, but we pray according to the will of God, the will of God that looks past see this happened in the life of Jesus in Gethsemane in Gethsemane Jesus had two wills that were fighting each other there was the promise and the joy that was set before him but then there's also his flesh and the word of God says that he sweat like blood out of his pores because of the burden of sin because of the burden of pain and Jesus said within himself oh God if this be your will let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will not the will of this weak flesh not the will of the weaknesses of this mind but your will be done why? Because there is divinity within him that could see the salvation of the world. And it drove him to pray according to the destiny of God and the will of God. And you have that same thing working on the inside of you. It's not just for your life. It's not just for your personal salvation. Can I tell you, it's also for your ministry. It's also for this city. It's also for this state. It's also for this world. It's obvious to see that this city is dark and full of corruption. But there is a church that's had a revelation in the spirit. Not according to what man can see. But what we have seen in the spirit. There's, is there, is there's going to be revival. There's going to be revival. There's going to be revival and the human eyes cannot see it, but my spirit has touched it. And there is a joy that now has been set before me. You see, this is the joy that I'm talking about. It not only applies to your life, it applies to your ministry. Brother Flores, that means every Bible study. We got to see the joy that's set before us. Not the sinners that come, but what might become of them if the Holy Ghost gets upon them. What we mean. Hey. And sometimes there's pain that we have to endure as the church of the living God. There is sacrifice that we have to endure. You see, I'm not, I'm not a father. I have children. I don't have any children, but I've been a high school teacher. And I can tell you one thing. If there's people who feel pain, it's high school teachers. Lord, have mercy. God bless all our high schoolers. Right? But this is the thing about a high school teacher is that we have to learn to have a revelation of the joy that is set before us. 
we cannot observe these teenagers as we are but we see the potential of the what they will become and so we're willing to endure why because each and every one of these teenagers they're going to become a woman and a man of God and God's going to give them his calling and God's going to anoint them to preach the gospel and I got to look beyond what I see there's a sacrifice that I have to pay Sister Butler, that means that Freedom Ministry, we can't afford to see people according to their problems. But we've had a revelation of what they can be. So we intercede in the spirit. Ha <laughs> ha. Ha ha, right, right. And we have give God eight. We got, have give God eight. And we know that this is going to cause some waves, Sister Haney. You've told me that. But there's a price to pay. There's a pain to pay. But we see what the women of God will become if they get a hold of their identity. Pastor Ellis, we got a young adults who are here who need identity. And some of them aren't going to like what we have to say. But it's the word of God. And the word of God brings life. And we can't judge them according to what we see and the failures that they've done. But we see their ministries. We see what God is going to do through their lives. And so we are willing to endure pain for the joy that is set before us. Can we stand to our feet today as the music comes? Another section that I won't have time to preach today on the shaking of this world. But for now, I want to I want to talk to you about this. We become weary. We become tired. We become less willing to walk in the kingdom of God many times because we forget the revelation of the joy that is set before us. And we lose the joy of what it meant to be involved in ministry. We lose the ability to see past people's faults and we become bitter at people who make mistakes, at people who transgress against us and against people we love. We become bitter and we're willing to endure less. Endurance is not in our spirits. Why? Because we need a fresh revelation of the joy that is set before us. You need a fresh revelation of the joy that is set before you. That's what you need. You need a fresh revelation of what it means to be a mother and be a father. Some of you have been frustrated perhaps with your children. I'm only saying this because I know the principles of the matter. I just know the biblical principles. But you know that there's a reinvigoration to go to work every day and provide for your family. Not because what you see in front of you, little babies, little children, but you see a whole life in front of them. And you're trying to provide a foundation for their lives. Because you can see where they might go. You can see that they will have, be married and they will have, they'll follow the will of God for themselves. And for that sake, you sacrifice every day. You have a revelation of the joy that is set before you. But when we forget of that revelation, about that revelation, then we start only observing that which is wrong, that which is painful. We start observing and the career, our job becomes more and more bitter every single day because you begin to ask yourself, why am I here? Why? Where's the joy? Why am I doing what I'm doing? We get into these patterns of waking up, going to work, coming home, eating, sleeping, waking up, go to work, eat, sleep, wake up, work, eat, sleep, wake up, work, eat, sleep, wake up, work, Eat, sleep, cycle, 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 cycle. 
until God reinvigorates your joy and you jump out of that cycle, you realize what is this all for? God wants to bring you out of the monotony of your life and give you a revelation of his glory. Where is God taking you? What does God want you to do? If you have a revelation of what God, where God is taking you, I promise you, you'll be, you'll be able to endure a little bit more. You'll be able to endure the requirements of fulfilling the destiny of God for your life. What you need today is a revelation of the joy that is set before you. Does anyone desire that this morning? Can we raise our hands right now, God, in the name of Jesus? Ooh, I know, God, that our pain is giving birth to a promise. I know, for the word of God says, oh, that the, com the current sufferings are nothing to be compared for the glory, God, that you have prepared. Does anyone want a revelation of joy this morning? I want to invite you. You're welcome to come to this altar. And what you need is for God to open up your eyes again. Hey, ask God to open up your eyes again. God, why am I here? What have you called me for? Who will be saved? Why? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Who am I investing for? And God is going to give you a revelation. He's going to give you an understanding. This is the joy that is set before you. <laughs> there is victory that is waiting for you. There is salvation that is waiting for you. There is life on the other side of this pain. <laughs> God God has great things in store for you. He has great things waiting for you. Get a revelation today. He's going to open up your eyes. For eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. But they're revealed in the spirit. They're revealed when you intercede in the Holy Ghost. Oh, somebody pray in the Holy Ghost today. Let the Spirit intercede through you. Let the Spirit reveal something through you. Oh, there is life after pain. There is There is life after suffering. There is life after the price that you have to pay. There's a promise. A promise. God's given you the joy of a promise. God's given you the joy of a blessing. The joy of a promise today. Great things in store 
See 